Welcome back to Coffee Break Archaeology. I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks for watching. Hello there and welcome back to Coffee Break Archaeology where today we'll be looking at Dawn of Man, a game that was uh, sent to me by a friend of mine to form part of my Archeo Gaming Let's Play series. Now if you're not aware of my Archeo Gaming Let's Play series or what Archeo, Archeo Gaming is, then you can check out my uh, Archeo Gaming blog series at www.coffeebreakarchaeology.blog. And also check out uh, my current Let's Play series on the Archaeology Dating Simulator C14. Now I'm not going to do a complete Let's Play today. What I wanted to do was, because it's a relatively new game, I had not heard of it up until yesterday when I was sent the game, um, I thought I would uh, do a little overview of the game and do a sort of mini Let's Play of the tutorial for you guys uh, out there. And um, maybe talk about... Uh, about my plans for the sort of archaeo gaming and let's plays uh, for the immediate future. So here we've got the uh, Steam page of Dawn of Man up. Command a settlement of ancient humans. Guide them through the ages in their struggle for survival. Hunt, gather, craft tools, fight, research, new te techs, and face the challenges. The environment will throw at you. So there are a couple of the uh, screenshots. It does have some very good um, reviews so far on Steam. I think it's got a rating of 9 out of 10. Not that I generally go by uh, game reviews really. I tend to like to experience it myself. So if I think it looks good then I will play it. So about the game. Dawn of Man is a survival city builder from the creators of Planet Base. I don't really know what planet base is actually. Uh, take control of a settlement of the first modern humans. Guide them through the ages in their struggle for survival. The game starts in the Stone Age and takes you up to the Iron Age, spanning more than ten thousand years of human prehistory. You'll get. You'll have to get your people to survive, expand, and evolve, just like our ancestors facing the challenges in the environment. Challenges that the environment will throw at you. So, there you go. Hunt. Animals were a vital source of food and resources for the ancient humans. Use their meats to feed your people and their skin and bones to make clothing and craft tools. You'll need to stay alive. Confront mammoths, woolly rhinos, ancient bison, cave lions and other species that roam the earth at the time. Gather. Collect a variety of resources from the environment. Fruit, berries, water, wood, flint, stone, ores. Use them to prepare food and to make and build structures in your settlement. Plan for harsh times. Fish is more abundant in the spring. Berries and fruit can be collected in the summer and animals are easier to come by when it's warm. When winter comes, make sure you have enough non-perishable food and warm clothing to survive. And finally, expand and fortify your settlement. Build more homes and facilities for your people in order to expand your population construct fortifications and craft weapons so you're ready for when the inevitable conflict comes. And in just case you're interested, there are the uh, system requirements. Okay, so now we've looked at that, let's actually head over to the game and see what's what. So here we go, here is the opening uh, page with a lovely sort of animated scene going on in the background which I quite like Got some people with some baby mammoths maybe some bison dogs or cave lines maybe and a lovely sunset isn't that very nice okay so we're gonna start off with the tutorial so also wait for us for load as I said I'm doing this as part of my um, archaeo gaming uh, Let's Play series on my exploration of Archeo Gaming, which has been inspired by this book by Andrew Reinhard. Um, so, in brief, Archeo Gaming is the archaeology of and in video games. Video game development 14, and this game I've got a couple of others. Um, if you've got any suggestions, please write them down in the comments. And again, I would appreciate any tips or feedback 
about my videos as uh, this is really the first time I'm doing these kind of videos so I don't have a great deal of experience uh, in, in that field, in this field. So, uh, but please make the uh, comments constructive and nice otherwise I'll be very very sad. So again, this is just taking a little time to load because my laptop I'm running it on is quite old now. I really need to uh, upgrade to a um, better machine. And uh, with the uh, game today, I'm enjoying a nice bottle of the, uh, the Blanford Fly. This is a, a lovely sort of sweetened uh, spicy golden ale. Nice and refreshing for spring evening. So whilst we're waiting for this to load, I do hope to upload the uh, next episode in the C14 Archeo Gaming series, hopefully later this week, hopefully maybe about Thursday or Friday if I get things together, or maybe over the weekend. Um, I am going to complete that game before I move on to the next game, but I just want to do a little tutorial, mainly to give myself a break from playing the game, uh, and also just to... Um, give you a idea of what it's going to be like when the let's play comes out so it's now loaded it's now asking me to press the any key i can't see an any key where's the any key oh there it is so i have a silly sense of humor so here we go i'm actually running the game on its uh, lowest graphic settings because again i said my computer is quite old uh, but i even think for, for the lowest graphic settings just what i'm looking at it looks really nice i really like the visual graphics even the water effects just from here look really good we can Hopefully get a chance to look at those close and some of these other details as well. So, welcome to Dawn of Man. In the game, you control a band of ancient humans striving for survival. This tutorial explains the basics. You can check the in-game help for more advanced directions. Okay, let's proceed. Camera controls. Dawn of Man uses FPS style camera controls. Move the camera using the W, A, S and D keys. Rotate the camera using the Q and E keys. And zoom the camera using the mouse wheel. Okay, let's give that a go. Let's zoom in. Have a look at our little people. Move about with the W, A, S and D keys. Look at that. You get all the reflections. The light shimmering. I love it. So, fish button down here in the bottom right hand corner. So, click on that to fish. In general, you can assign tasks to your people by selecting the objects like trees, rivers and animals and structures, then choosing one of the options in the selection panel. It's very micromanagement. Materials. The next thing you should be gathering are some basic construction and crafting materials like sticks and flint. So it looks like I've got some flint over here. Let's have a look and zoom in. Definitely flint, nice and shiny. So collect that. And some fallen sticks on the ground. Far, far away from any trees. Must have very strong wind. There we go. Wait for your people to get one unit of raw fish sticks and flint. Use button or press 4 to speed the game. Now, a little trick I have learned. If you click on one of these uh, icons here, you can expand menus. Select speed. And then we can do this. Just so you know, I have actually played through the tutorial about three or four times now to uh, test footage for this video. And also I have actually played a little bit into the main game as well, just to find out a little bit more about the game. So, you know now how to assign tasks to your people. This is a good way of micromanaging them. Too much micromanagement is tedious and inefficient. Work areas are a way to give general commands to your settlements that people will perform continuously. You can specify a location, a resource limit and the maximum number of people performing the action at one given time. So we want to place a fish work area. So icon for work areas down here, like this little flag. And we want fishing. And we sort of want to put that there, I guess. There we go. Uh, now we want a gather sticks work area, which is there. And there's a good number of sticks we can collect. We want a collect flint. There we go. And finally, 
natural gathering resources like berries and fruit. All these in a nice convenient area. Work, a work areas. By default, only one person at a time will go to any given work area, but you can increase this if required. So now it wants us to three workers to gather sticks. Oh, that's four. One too many. And two for flint. There we go. And then we want to you so we ought to wait for people to get to get three units of sticks and flint and again we can change the control over here with some structure so we go to main menu it's uh, processes of building the frame looks good. so explain it quickly here um the purpose of the game is to go from the paleolithic all the way through to the iron age so paleolithic mesolithic neolithic copper age bronze age Iron Age. Now you do this by gaining knowledge points to research the different texts in the tech trees for those periods and then to get to the new period you've got to gather enough tech points for what's the tech specific um, or iconic uh, uh, technology for that period and those often cost a lot more about double the techs or three times the techs that you've been working with in that period and they're done through various different um, achievements by reaching different population levels, by gathering a certain number of resources or gathering new types of resource. But that will go into more detail in a moment. Crafting. To craft tools, select the crafter, then click on the tool recipe. The crafting task will be added to the queue and one of your people will perform it as soon as they can. Let's craft some wooden spears to hunt animals with and some bifaces to butcher them. So we click on our crafter. So here we've got the two ones that we can do at the moment. We've got the biface, general purpose cutting tool, and the wooden spear, basic hunting tool. So I want to make three of each. And then again, speed up time for those to be produced. Now I do like it does give a little description of the tools and what they're for, and it also gives stats for them to show you how good the tool is in relation to other similar tools. Which is quite nice. So we're just waiting for those tools to be crafted. You can actually see someone there sitting on the logs, either napping some flint or sharpening some sticks for a spear. By face, and now we're done. Well done. We now have all the tools we need to go hunting. Hunting. Hunting was a tricky business in the Stone Age. Killing a large animal with sticks and stones was no easy feat. Use primal vision to find easy prey highlighted in green. Avoid large animals and carnivores until you have the right tools and manpower. To hunt an animal, select it, click on the hunting button, and then you're done. Okay, so there's two ways of getting to primal vision. You can either click it on the menu down here, or you can press the tab button, and then the world all goes grey. So, what do we have close by which is easy for us to hunt? We've got some green down there, but we've also got... Uh, what looks like an oak, so we don't want to get too close to that really, it may attack us. Uh, oh, we've got, we've got a boar down here. Let's hunt some boar. Let's be a real boar about it. <laughs> get Be a real boar about it. Never mind. So again, we can... Actually, I'm just going to pause it here as our person goes into hunt, because it's actually quite nice. Again, it's something it doesn't tell you in the um, tutorial, but it's something I found out playing with the controls is that actually you can focus the camera on the person. So you sort of go into sort of a third person mode where your camera sort of focuses on the head as its focus point. And then again, you can zoom in quite far. And now if I, uh, can I unpause it from here? Okay, no, so I'll just have to uh, keep him selected, press eight and go in with the camera. Once the animal has been hunted, your people will butcher it and bring its resources to camp. When hunting this in this manner, your people will decide how many of them to send based on the difficulty of the prey. So we didn't see the hunt, but we can see him processing it. Sometimes you might want to you might want more control over your people's actions. You can do this by selecting a few people and then right-clicking on the terrain or target. This way you can move people around or sign one or more individuals to a particular task. This is especially useful for hunting at the beginning of the game when resources and manpower are limited. 
So here we can see him butchering the carcass. So we'll come up that mode. Because we need to send two people to hunt the same animal. Select them. Ooh, we've got a child there. They won't go hunting. I need someone else. I need two spare people. Two spare. There's one. No. Oh. No. Just give me two. I just want two. Games are having a well. My laptop's potentially having a few issues. There we go. Are you two adults? No, that's a child and so we'll select you two finally. So now I need to find another boar. What's slightly uh, irritating that the second time you do this in a tutorial, you can't use primal vision. Uh, that's not a boar. No. Oh, okay. It's going to accept that anyway. Although it probably won't. Oh, no, it will. Okay. Wasn't the same type of animal, but there we go. But I say the second time, you can't use primal vision, so you kind of have to keep an eye out for yourself, which sometimes can be tricky. I say animals do blend quite nicely into the terrain. So, skins. One of the resources you obtain from animals are raw skins. They are used to craft clothing and build structures, among other things. However, raw skins can not be used directly. You'll have to dry them first. In order to do this, you need to build some skin dryers. So, we're back on the building train. We've got some skin dryers. So, let's pop those near the craft, as that kind of makes sense. I don't think I put crafts are probably in the best position, but there we go. It just looked good at the time. So there are our two skin dryers. And again, we can speed it up to wait for them to build it and then also to process two skins. And as you can see, we've been slowly gathering knowledge, knowledge points. One for hunting a new animal and also one for building skin dryers. Now you can see them actually putting up the skin dryers, which have the skins to dry, which I think is a really lovely touch. And actually, as they dry, you actually see them change colour, which I think is another really nice little detail. Which, again, they probably didn't have to put in, but this looks really, really cool and just adds a little bit to the immersive value of the game. And just that extra little detail just makes it seem a more quality game altogether. And again, I don't know about you, but I am really loving the detail here. As I said, I am only running it on the lowest graphics settings. I may, for the Let's Play, actually put it up a little bit and see how it performs. So there we go. There's it changed. So basically, the, the thing I just pan I just skipped through very quickly accidentally was basically telling us to always keep a good supply of dry skins on hand as they are useful for crafting and for structures, especially in the early stages of the game. So knowledge, this is now we're getting onto knowledge points. In the game, you can earn knowledge points when doing certain actions, hunting new animals, gathering new resources, reaching certain population levels, ETC, etc, etc. You can then use them to research new texts, which unlock new structures, plants or mechanics. So you can guess what our next thing is. The food drying tech unlocks the food dryer, which allows you to process raw meat and raw fish into cured meat and dry fish. These last for longer and can be stored for winter in a safe place. So, we're going to go to our knowledge trees and research the food dryer or food drying. So, here you see we've got the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and here are some of the different uh, researches or text that you can research in these areas. We'll have a look at the Paleolithic one very quickly for the tutorial purposes. We've got bone tools, which allow us to make, uh, well, bone tools. And then composite tools. So things like spears, axes, and, and knives. Slingshots, the food dryer, dog domestication, tannin, and spirituality, which will allow us to build a few uh, totems in the early stages, but, leave, but there you can see what it's required for, for the next stages. 
And then the text to unlock the new eras is pottery making for the Mesolithic, seal domestication for the Neolithic, copper smelting for the Copper Age, bronze smelting for the Bronze Age. And can you guess what it is for the Iron Age? You probably have it. It's iron smelting for the Iron Age. Now, pottery here is slightly dubious as there's still much debate about when pottery actually arrives. I do actually quite like it being in a Mesolithic. Um, again, new research suggesting that pottery does predate Neolithic areas, uh, Neolithic production. And also, it kind of suggests that, you know, people were playing with the ideas earlier before the ideas come and we see them in the archaeological record generally what survived are the fully formed ideas. We don't often see the things they've been playing with, the things they've been testing with. So it does give an indication that maybe in this period, especially in the Mesolithic, where, you know, people were semi-sedentary, they were exploiting uh, areas a lot more, they were exploiting seasons a lot more, um, so they may have they may have been playing around with clay. What is a little bit um, interesting here is they do have you as a sort of almost permanent settlement. Although I guess you can play with that idea yourself and you can move yourself probably around the map. Um, I guess I haven't actually really tried doing that. That again might be a good thing to do in the Let's Play um, uh, to exploit new areas or build new structures there. I, 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 I'll have to test that out. But you know, in the Paleolithic, you know, people were still very nomadic. They were foaling. Um, migration patterns of animals often and, and, and also changing places due to the season but that's mainly to do with what food was available and, and water and all those other important resources where in the Meso Mesolithic you, they actually start to focus on certain particular areas and start to encourage uh, certain things to, to grow um, by replanting them you know they do start to look at uh, you know trying to get certain types of animal to breed with each other the, the beginners of domestication but again not everything happens everywhere all at once and in different places different things happen first um and and different things the, the development is not exactly the same all over the world anyway uh, that was quite enough rambling uh let's click on the food drive and get back to the tutorial again this is a tutorial of a game for Archeo Gaming, not a deep discussion on the different prehistoric eras, but it is interesting to see how they are representing those eras. That is part of Archeo Gaming, but again, all the games I'm looking at are archaeology themed or historically themed, but for Archeo Gaming that doesn't have to be the case, it can be applied to any game. But part of Archeo Gaming is where archaeology is portrayed in a game, how is it being portrayed and what does it say about the field to a wider public? what kind of ideas will people get about archaeology from these games. So we've sort of waited a certain amount of seasons for it, so unlike in uh, say uh, Age of Empires or uh, Civilization where you have to, it takes time to research the text or I guess uh, Medieval Total War or things like that, here they are available to you as soon as you spend the points. So we'll put uh, uh let's put that let's put near the half that seems like a good place to put it and again going back to the artistic qualities i do like again that the detail of the tents they are again not permanent structures so it might suggest that you know these people are just here for a few seasons um but your settlement doesn't physically move unless you move it uh it's way down with stones you've got the sort of um rope or, or leather and sticks making a, tying things together on the outer frame and you've got the woven stick uh, making up the main body uh, storage tent and let's build our store tent and again let's put that you can actually rotate your buildings using the Z and C keys let's put that over here near some of the resources and there we go why don't we put it there so there we go and again you can see the people sort of building the food dryer and now we've got to wait for them to produce one unit of cured fish 
uh, cured meats and dry fish. So again, we'll speed up the time frame for them to do that. All very nice. Um, so here you can actually see them on the back. And again, just like the skins, they will change colour over time, which again, I think is a really lovely detail. Again, it just adds that let little bit of artistic and believability to what's going on. So again, you can see what some of them are starting to go slightly brown. Anime is starting to go slightly a uh, bit, you know, a bit darker and they will change. Again, this is quite a long process actually in game. This is one of again one of the longer periods of the tutorial tools where you're just sort of sitting here having a look around other than crafting materials. Remember to always dry your food and keep it in storage structure to preserve it for as long as possible. So there we go. Continuous production. Manually producing every item is tedious and inefficient. You can right click on a recipe and toggle for continuous production. Your people will then keep on producing that item until the resource limit is reached. And again, this is another um, aspect that I like. There is a certain amount of micromanagement or macromanagement you can do. Um, and again, from my experience, you'll need to do both, um, especially in the later game where you've got more resources to manage and you're trying to produce more things. Um, you want to macromanage some areas and micromanage other areas, especially when shortages come in. Um, due to seasons, if you food, your population is rising quicker than you expected, um, or the food isn't there, you know, there's not as much animals around to hunt, for example, or you've just not been paying close enough attention. I am not guilty of that at all. So there is quite a lot of flexibility with how you can run your settlement. And again, I'll talk about more of these ideas and details when I actually do the Let's Plays. But again, I did want to do the tutorial properly and have a proper talk through about what's going on on the screen and how I feel about it and again that's part of RPO game as well you know how do people respond to the games as artifacts as physical objects as the finish as the product and how do they respond to the landscapes in which they create so your people continues will now continuously produce the, the tools until the resource limits reached, note that some recipes are set to continuous production by default, such as the skins and the drying of the meat. Or that's a continuous progress process because you are probably continuously producing the things that produce those materials to appear. Expansion: If everything, if everyone is well fed and taken care of, your settlement will reach a high level of welfare and prestige, and more people will want to join it. For new people to join the village, you have. You, you will have to build enough residence, residence buildings to accommodate the new population, otherwise they will not come. So we need to place two tents. So if we oh, build our residence buildings. So, oh, come on. Say an invalid location. Yeah, I'm not trying to build it there. It's because the game's auto saving, that's why. It's nice when it does that, but it does make you wonder if it's free frozen. So let's, um, maybe not the most defensive or, or wise idea, but I want to give this one sort of a riverside view. You know, really entice people, make, bring up the uh, estate, uh, estate value for that property. And this one can sort of curve in towards the camp. But let's actually keep this, let's put some little bends so we sort of start to create a little perimeter of huts around our resources and people. So now we've got to wait for our people to build the tents. So again, we'll bring that back up to eight. And again, depending on, you know, what they're doing and what resources they had gathered, this can sometimes take amount of time. An option down here, which is in a real game, is you can set things for different priorities. So you can make making these buildings a higher priority, which means people will try and do that over other tasks they're doing or any inactive members of your little tribe or little clan or little settlement will come and start doing that job hopefully. in theory in theory let's just make sure webcam's actually 
not focusing too much on my face because no one wants to see that. So there we go, those are our two tents built. Well done. New humans will now join your settlement. Note that your settlement can also grow when your people reproduce. This plays a more important role when you reach a larger population as you will have a larger number of births. You now know the basics on how to run a settlement. Note that there are quite a few other mechanics in the game that are not explained here. You can get more info about the loading uh, through the loading screen, UI tooltips or the in-game help menu that explain all the concepts in the game with a lot more detail. So that really brings us to the end of the tutorial. I actually do just want to go back to main menu and I want to click on new game very quickly because now we have free play games with different modes. You've got um, milestones which actually unlock new ways and new, uh, and new game um, ideas. So there is, there's that incentive to, you know, play through as much as you can to unlock all the milestones so then you can move on. So I guess it's almost like stages or, or levels of the game. And there's also different challenge modes. Um, bygone tales for example or you've got creative modes um which these are these are actually unlocked already so you can get creative i have actually only just really noticed that if i'm honest and uh after this video i may play around that and record another video uh, video in the creative modes maybe exploring some of the wider game concepts before i do the let's play although that might not be released immediately that video but again you've got these different uh, challenges and again they have different criteria for unlocking so you've got to unlock this one by reaching one milestone and then do the different ones in order to get those. So actually there are different ways of playing the game. So that gives us a little bit more um, scope for exploring the game. And, um, you know, it will be hopefully quite fun to play with. So what do you think about the game? Are you looking forward to finding out some more about it? Again, if you've played the game, please let me know um, what you've done. Please give me any tips uh, you you've had whilst you found whilst playing. Um, I'm not going to use any walkthroughs other than the in-game menus uh, when I first play through because I want it to be a, a true experience. If I said I have played with it a little bit, that's mainly just so I don't completely make a fool of myself when I do the walkthroughs. First of all, something I can already say which I like about this game a lot, it's got a really, really good tutorial, I think. The issue I've had with the C14 Let's Plays I've been doing is there's new, no real tutorials about the game and very little explanation of the mechanics here it is very clear i know what's happening and i'm really looking forward to it so again i'm just going to mention this again just so so people really understand why i'm doing it i'm doing it because it is a game that deals with a period of prehistory and archaeology that i specialized in personally um during my degree and I'm still very fond of now and I try and keep up as much to date with uh, academia and research I need to get better at posting some of those things to my blog as well I really I, I do know that um, so I'm evaluating it with that in mind about its representation of the periods and um, and other academic research but again as I said through Archeo Gaming again I'm not trying to plug his book in a sponsorship deal i have no relation with andrew reinhard but i've really really enjoyed his book part of doing this is also to review the book and review the frameworks and ideas that are set out in it there are lots of other archeo gaming um bits out there andrew reinhard also has a very good blog again i'll link it down in the video description please do go and check it out um i really really enjoy what he does archeo soup as well if you're aware of archeo soup he's done a little bit looking at it and there are many others out there now it is very much an emerging field um and it means i can do it from the comfortability from the comfortable comfortability if that's a word of my office so again thank you very much for joining me to join me today again i wanted this to be a reasonably quick video so it's coming up for 40 minutes so i am going to leave it here but again if you like the video then please do hit that like button if you want to find out more about the game and you want to be notified about when um, I upload please do subscribe and hit the no notification bell um, and all I can say is thank you again so much for watching as I said hopefully the next let's play of C14 will be up later this week and until then 
Take care and remember, don't eat each other. And something I forgot to do in the main video is say thank you to Michael Noel Jones who bought the game for me. So thank you, I hope you enjoy this video and the Let's Play series as well. Thank you.